We're following Paul's letter this morning to the Galatians. And we see that in that letter, Paul teaches them and ourselves that our right standing before God is an act of grace. And we receive that through our faith in Jesus Christ. It's a gift that can't be earned, not by religion, not by church rituals, not by human effort. We live by faith found only in Jesus Christ, God's Son. Hallelujah. Is that right? Oh, I thought you'd all gone to sleep again. Amen. So in the first couple of chapters of Galatians, Paul defends the origin of the gospel that he preaches. He's continually saying that it's from God. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the middle chapters, he turns to the Old Testament. He refers particularly to God's promise to Abraham to have a son. And that son was given not by the law, but by his faith. In the final chapters, which hopefully we look at this morning, show the practical meaning of the gospel of freedom and what it means. So Linda's going to come up and read us. Obviously, we can't read all four, five, and six, but Linda's going to read us Galatians 5. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a voice of slavery. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is required to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. But by faith we eagerly await, through the Spirit, the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion will pay the penalty, whoever he may be. Brothers, if I'm still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. You, my brothers, were called to be free. Do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, 
goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Thank God for his word. If you're following the church reading plan, you'll have read all that this week and you'll know it all. Christ has set us free by his death and his resurrection. He set us free from sin and from a long list of rules and regulations. The Jews had a long list of Moses' laws that they had to keep. We are set free from rules and regulations in that respect. But we are not set free to do what we want. Because then we would simply become slaves to our own selfish wishes. But we are free to do what before was impossible. Because of Adam's fallen nature, it was impossible to be unselfish. Now it is possible. No longer do we need to be enslaved by rules or special conditions we have to observe, but we can stand firm and free in the salvation provided for us by Jesus and accept his gracious gift. Now, through this, our faith in Jesus, we are free to serve him and to serve one another in love, loving our neighbor as ourself. If we use that freedom to do what our sinful nature encourages us to do, what we are encouraged to do every day in one way or another, if we use that freedom to do those sinful things that we know are not of God, then we simply abuse the freedom that we've been given. The Galatians at first followed the gospel that Paul had preached them. But as time went by, they began to move away, just as we do sometimes. Sometimes life comes in between us and what we know we should be doing and the word we should be reading and the prayer times we should be having. And the Galatians were moving away slowly from what Paul had preached to them when he was with them. Perhaps they're listening to other people. We're not told why they're moving away. But what they are now hearing in Paul's absence was changing the gospel that Paul had preached to them. And Paul asked them, who cut in on you? Who kept you from obeying the truth? He knew they had accepted the gospel of Christ as the truth. But now he was hearing a completely different story. It was being changed. Now, Christians here this morning know the truth about how easy it is to conveniently forget, to stray away from the path. We all do it. We talk about other people. Sometimes we put wrong answers on a tax form and we make excuses to ourselves to justify what we've done. How many of us may apply for benefits and conveniently forget to put some information in because that will alter the amount of benefit that we received. How many of us declare this morning that we are Christians and we accept and follow the gospel? when we use bad language behind closed doors, and when we fall out with family 
and friends. When we get irate about something because things aren't done the way we think they should be. It's so easy, isn't it, today, as it was in Galatia, to move away from the truth. And it's easier still to try to justify what we are doing. And this is why we all need the Holy Spirit to help us to stay on the road of truth. To stand firm, we must have the Holy Spirit and we must look always to the truth who is Jesus. Living by the Spirit means wanting to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. It means simply wanting and willing to obey God and living every day guided by him because he always points us to Jesus. He fills us with the love of Jesus and he gives us self-control to help prevent us from falling into sin. If we can say that Jesus is Lord, then we have already received the Spirit of God. But living by the Spirit is completely different. It means obedience. It means following the morals of Jesus and the two commandments that he gave us of loving God and loving God one another. This is a very, very narrow and difficult path to follow, is it not? Who has found it easier being a Christian than not being a Christian? It's harder because the standards we have to follow are higher and more difficult and more unacceptable in the world that we live in today. The life of a Christian to me seems like that of a fish swimming upstream against the current. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but I sometimes get to the point of wondering when I've tried and tried and I'm tired of why I bother to keep going when so often I know I'm going to fail. But it's at these very times that the Spirit steps in if we focus on prayer and the Scriptures instead of focusing on ourselves. And he enables us and encourages us, as Paul would say, to continue the race. He will lead us. He will come along the road with us and help us to make the right choices. And in this chapter, Paul gives us a recipe for living through life, through Jesus Christ and his spirit. I'm quite used to having recipes to do cakes, but this is a different kind of recipe altogether. And Paul lists all the ingredients that we need as Christians in verses 22 and 23. The fruit of the spirit. This has often been described as the nine qualities that go to make up the Christian character. God's goal for our lives is that we are molded into the image of his son. And Paul confirms this in Romans where he says in Romans 8, God decided that those who came to him should become like his son. That's God's goal for us. That's why we have these nine characteristics, these nine ingredients for living. Where there is the fruit of the Spirit, we know that the Spirit is at work. Each person living in the Spirit has the fruit differently. We're none of us the same. And each fruit has a different shape in every person because no two people are the same. But all the fruit will show itself 
in each Christian as we go deeper in our work and our walk with God. Because fruit flows out of obedience. The Spirit puts this fruit into us, into our personalities. And the ingredients are the very nature of Christ Jesus. How privileged is that, eh? God puts in us these nine characteristics that really started in Jesus. And he puts them in you and me. That makes me feel very humble because I know how unworthy I am to accept. And I know it's only through the grace of God and the love of God that we can accept, that we do have them in our nature. Those of us know, those who are gardeners and have allotments, that when we plant anything, we cannot, no matter how much we try, we cannot make it grow. I've just put three little tomato plants in this week. They're only this big. Now, no matter how much I water them and how much I look at them and how much I will them to grow, I cannot make them grow. It is God who makes things grow. And it's the same with the fruit of the Spirit. It's planted in us. We have to encourage it to grow by giving it attention, by trying our best, and by allowing the Holy Spirit to feed it and bring it into ripeness and fruition. And that's what it means by living by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit ministers to us in two particular ways. And as we're coming up to um, Whitsuntide, and we'll find out more about Pentecost and the Holy Spirit, but he, he does minister to us in two ways. He wants to make us more pure, and he wants to give us spiritual power. He demonstrates his power through the gifts, and I think he demonstrates his purity through the fruit. So when we allow the Holy Spirit to take root in our hearts, these nine special qualities will come. They will be produced. Not because of what we've done, but because we allow God to water it and prune it and nurture it from within. Paul talks about being the son and one in Christ. In Ephesians, when he says, and in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So the first fruit of the Spirit is love. And I think this is the main distinguishing mark of any child of God or of any member of God's family. And some say it is the main work of a Christian. And I have three references. The first one is in 1 John 4. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And then from 1 Corinthians 13, even if we have faith that moves mountains, but do not have love, we are nothing. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. We are to love others as we are being loved by God, and he loves us unconditionally. Every fruit of the Spirit mentioned in Galatians is also mentioned 
in Corinthians 13, the supernatural or agape love. And you've got them on the sheet. I printed some out just so we can compare. <coughs> patience. And it tells us in Corinthians that love is patient. You will notice that it's love is patient. In kindness, love is kind. Goodness, love does not envy. Gentleness, love does not boast and is not proud. Self-control and peace. Love is not self-seeking and is not easily angered. Joy. Love rejoices in the truth and faithfulness. Love always protects, always hopes, and always perseveres. I printed those because I think we can make use of those throughout the days, the weeks that are ahead. We can maybe read them every day. Just read through 22 and 23 of Galatians and see if it makes a difference to the way you live, the way you look at things, if it changes you in any way. So after stating what the fruit of the Spirit is, Paul then goes on to show the Galatians and we Christians today how to live by the Spirit, putting the fruit into practice. And this all revolves around love. In Romans 13, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor in serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, and share with God's people who are in need, practicing hospitality. The body of Christ, the church, only functions successfully when the members work together for the common good, looking out for each other and sharing each other's concerns. If we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us, he will produce the fruit in us, provided we are united in Jesus Christ. Are we united in Jesus Christ? Sometimes personalities clash. Sometimes there are people we find it very difficult to get on with. Are we still united? Do we still work together? Do we really love one another? Do we know the Holy Spirit? Do we live by the Holy Spirit? Are we willing to let him change us and to lead us where we need to go? He lives in each one of us. Maybe not particularly because he wants to. He might. Looking at me, I can't think he would want to live in me, but he might like to live in us. But he does live in us. And he does that to lead us to victory so that our lives can glorify God through Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit needs to be present and active in our lives if we are Jesus' disciples. So if you don't feel you're living in the Spirit or you want to know him better, to be a better disciple, to be a better Christian, to be a better servant of Jesus Christ. 
then please talk to one of the leaders, to Adrian and Linda, or Richard and Gordon, myself, or even ask for prayer. Because the Holy Spirit eagerly awaits those who want him in their lives. And if we are going to follow Christ, we cannot do it without the Holy Spirit in our lives. So if he's not in your life, or you're not living by him, or you want to know more, or you want him to be more active in your life, talk to somebody about it. Because then the church will be united, it will grow. And the kingdom of God will grow. And more people will know by our love that we are Christ's disciples. So during the next few weeks, say until we get to Pentecost, or even after that, let me again suggest that every day we try to say verses 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit. Every day, even if it's only once, and just see if it makes a difference in our lives. We all have things in our lives that we know we shouldn't be there. But Christ died to give us freedom. And that freedom is to free us from walking burdened down with guilt.